All right, everyone. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Matt Lacerdo. I am the director of the domestic and affinity programming here at Northeastern's alumni office. And we're really happy to have you uh, tonight for this really great event. Um, if you can, uh, just so you know, if you can make sure to update your information and rename yourself, just so we can make sure that we get uh, right attendance for the event, that'd be great. And also just to let you know, we are recording this event. So if there's any time you have to go to use the restroom or something like that and come back and miss something, it'll be up on YouTube in a little while to be able to have a chance for you to connect and, and find the more information that you're looking for. Um, if you can also, one of the things that we always suggest people to do is put an in-speaker review. Um, when you have an in-speaker review, you'll have both Melissa and Chris on at the same time, so you can be able to hear that. So with that, I know you don't want to hear me talk. Let's get right into the show. So I'll pass it off to Melissa. Melissa, take it away. Great. Thank you, Matt. So hi, I'm Melissa Pekin, and I'm the Director of Undergraduate Co-op for Corey College of Computer Sciences. And I've been with the college for 12 years on the co-op and advising team. And I've had the pleasure of working with Chris as his instructor for a core preparation class back in 2010, I believe, Chris. Um, and also as his co-op advisor. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> throughout his time at Northeastern. And believe it or not, Chris, I actually still remember where you sat in class, really? which is crazy to me. I can still picture you. Yes. And so I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Chris Jelly. Uh, so I graduated from Corey College in 2014. Um, and since then, I've worked in various Boston startups uh, in software engineering roles um, and also started the Jelly Incubation Fund for Corey College, um, which funds student projects, uh, some of you may have seen. OK, great. So I have some questions for you. So I'll just kick it off. Um, and I know, as, as Matt said, that if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll try to get to them as best we can. So Chris, so take us back a little bit and tell us initially, you know, why you chose to come to Northeastern. Yeah, sure. So um, I think initially, like over my high school experience, um, doing college visits, I was kind of optimizing for a cool campus, which obviously was a shallow perspective. Um, but then I got to Northeastern and I found that it had like both the, um, the cool campus, the city life, uh, the good location, and also it had this strong co-op program that I think um, really made my decision uh, an easy one when I was deciding where to, where to um, matriculate. Okay, awesome. So speaking of the co-op program, which I'm obviously quite fond of, um, can you share what, in your opinion, sets Northeastern apart in preparing students for co-op and then ultimately the full-time job search? Yeah, so I think there's, um, there are other universities that do have co-op programs uh, or do have like robust internship programs and career services, but um, Northeastern, I think, given that it uh, incorporates it into the curriculum, makes it a requirement in some capacity uh, or some replacement of co-op in some capacity. And also the fact that they're six months long, um, combined with the strong industry partners, I think is um, definitely what makes Northeastern the winner across all the universities that offer co-op. Um, I would also say that the, uh, given that career services is uh, I think ranked number one or something in the world uh, or recently was at, at Northeastern um, using leveraging those partners as well uh, for both the full-time job search for students and then also for bringing in um, co-op employment. Uh, I think that synergy is also super useful as well. Yeah, we definitely work really, really closely with our partners in career design. And I think even since you've graduated that synergy, as you said, is even stronger. So absolutely. Um, so you had three co-ops while you were at Northeastern, uh, Intuit, HubSpot, and Insight Squared. So when you were on your co-ops, what were some of the key skills or takeaways that you gained that were different from what you learned in the classroom? Yeah, um, in the classroom, uh, so definitely the computer science curriculum, when I came to Northeastern originally, was not what I expected it to be. Um, it was definitely, uh, having experience with programming, it was definitely um, more theoretical and different uh, than I had expected, and I think that was the sentiment that a lot of students had shared, um, which wasn't a bad a bad thing at all. It was just different than expected. Uh, I think co-op is where I learned a lot of like my industry skills versus um, in class, but the stuff that I learned in class, uh, being able to have both at the same time and both coexisting during that five-year period um, kind of reinforced each other, which was uh, super useful on both sides. So coming back to class, for example, after a co-op, I was able to use some of the skills that I learned 
on co-op uh, to solve problems um, academically and then also using concepts I learned in class um, within my co-op experiences as well. Awesome. So I know one thing in, in working with students for as long as I've had, I've definitely seen how co-op can impact kind of future decisions, whether it's major decisions or just where you see yourself in the workplace. So did your co-op experience make you think differently about kind of what your post-college work life was going to be? Yeah, so I intentionally did two software engineering co-ops and then one product management co-op. Um, I wanted to kind of explore different um, career paths in that way. And I learned a lot about um, each role. And I think it helped me, it informed what I wanted to do after graduation by uh, knowing that I wanted to get more of a foundational engineering experience um, and skill set first before moving into another role. Um, and I learned that only because I did a, a third co-op that was a product management co-op. The other two were software engineering co-ops. And I learned a lot in all three, of course, but um, I think that really reinforced the idea of what I wanted to do full time. And so how do you think your co-op experiences helped you in your next steps? And maybe you can talk a little bit about what you started doing after graduation and kind of your path since then. Yeah, so um, after graduation, I, the first job I had was um, at Localytics and I actually got, uh, I was introduced to Localytics via a connection from Northeastern, um, a staff member at Northeastern that introduced me to, uh, I believe her son-in-law who worked there, who's a director of engineering there. Um, so in that uh, relationship began, um, or that relationship started because I was talking about my second co-op at HubSpot um, and how at HubSpot, we were building this and this for um, companies that uh, like different solutions for marketing uh, for small businesses. And then Localytics was doing something similar for app analytics. Um, and that connection was made um, through that, uh, that integration. That's great. And so I know currently um, you are at the Jelly, you are at Jelly Consulting. So how did you end up starting this and what kind of, what was the spark that led you to, to doing that? Yeah, so I worked for um, Localytics and then um, I worked at BevSpot and then I worked at Edmit um, after graduation. But I also, I, I think I purposefully was moving every couple of years to get a variety of experience and I realized that the freelance um, freelance work uh, style gives me more variety quickly and kind of throws me into it, which was something that um, if I uh, that I was intentionally seeking by by moving between jobs um, quickly in that way. So it really was driven from wanting to get more experience uh, and a variety of experience. And um, starting a small business, I think that was also a motivation that. Um, was uh, like, this was a good avenue to pursue that as well. Awesome. So beyond co-op and, you know, working obviously at your, at your consulting firm, how have you stayed involved and connected to Northeastern and Cory College as an alum? Um, okay, so when I was, I was definitely involved as a student. Um, and I think I'm even probably even more involved as an alum, which is a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, one example of a thing that I've done with the college is help plan um, different alumni meetups around uh, both Boston and New York. So we've had a few um, dinners or open bar events that we've invited alums to. Uh, and those have been largely networking events, um, partially for fundraising and for meeting. Um, this was, I think, after Carla Bradley had started as well. So it was for meeting the new dean uh, and involving parents of students that were accepted that um, weren't yet decided if they wanted to attend Northeastern or somewhere else. So those events, I think, integrate the students and the alums and the parents in a cool way. So I've been, that was one thing that I worked on with the college, uh, I think in 2017 and 2018. And then in 2017, I also started a fund to, um, to uh, provide grants to student projects that would otherwise not have uh, an obvious home within the university. So for example, a student project that involved um, entrepreneurship would probably go to IDEA or should go to IDEA or some mosaic org. Um, but if it's something that's like more research and not commercializable, uh, but still might be something that could be a business in the future, or might be something that the university would want um, to fund, that's what the Jill Incubation Fund is looking to, um, to provide grants for. So uh, that was driven from things that I had started when I was a student that I wanted to see through that I think there wasn't really that buy-in or alumni support for at the time. 
Oh, that's absolutely amazing and obviously so generous. Are you able to talk about um, any previous project that you you did fund through the Jelly Fund that, that you're able to kind of share, just an example? Yeah, so um, we had a an applicant that was building this. Um, this one stood out to me. So they were building a 3D scanner that scanned um, your whole body, or I believe your whole body or maybe your upper body or something. Um, and then it uh, there was some process where they would print a mini version of you uh, from that 3D scan. And that's an example where it's like, there's a commercial application for it possibly, and um, you could at least draw a line to that in some way, but right. it's not totally obvious where it would be fundable by uh, something that is looking for you to have customer validation and revenue, um, mm -hmm. or at least a path to that. So that one was, I think, a, a prime example of something that we had funded. That's great. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds fascinating. So getting back to co-op, I mean, I think it's it's pretty clear for a lot of students that choose Northeastern. Um, and I think that students can speak, you know, it speaks volumes that the experiences gained on co-op for students are really invaluable. But what do you see as the gains for a company in taking on a co-op student? The hiring pipeline is definitely something that the company gets um, as an ancillary benefit of the co-op. So mm -hmm. independent of like um, being able to hire a talented student, I, when I worked at HubSpot, most of our, uh, most of the co-op students that were at HubSpot were then offered a full-time job, uh, at least the year that I was there, which was 2012. Mm -hmm. um, so HubSpot used Northeastern's co-op program to both fill seats, um, valuable seats that they would otherwise have, um, would need to go out and recruit uh, a full-time person for, uh, and then also use that program to get a pipeline of people that they could recruit um, for full-time jobs after. And also the co-op program, given that uh, I think the price point is right, where the students get paid um, well within computer science. Um, and the company has, it's super high value for the company as well. Um, and it's analogous almost to a, um, to like a recruiting firm, for example, that would hire a full-time person and take like some, some percentage of their starting salary. You could almost say that that is equal to what they would have paid a co-op and also they got something out of it too. Um, and then the students obviously get a lot from that and uh, that's the primary motivation for the program, obviously. It's funny that you you mentioned you know HubSpot because I have visited that company many times and every time that I go, it feels like I'm running into so many alums. So it's, it's definitely still continuing to this day for sure. Yeah, so for sure. what advice would you give to alumni, some that may be watching this right now who are really looking for ways to stay connected and support current students? I would say hire co-op students. If your company um, is looking to hire more engineers or hire more product managers or designers, um, definitely hiring Corey College um, co-op students has been, at least for me, uh, rewarding. So at Edmit, we hired two co-ops and we had three different interns, all from Northeastern. Um, and at one point, I think four of them concurrently uh, and that was, they were um, effectively part of the team. And I think, or they were definitely part of the team. Like it felt like they were part of the team. It didn't feel like they were interns or co-ops. Um, I think that is rewarding for the student. It builds a relationship with the co-op employer. Um, and also as an alum, it's cool to see Northeastern students, uh, you know, doing what I was doing five or 10 years ago. Right. And obviously you're doing a great deal of mentorship, um, you know, with the incubation fund. But I'd also just like to add, and maybe you did this prior to, just that the mentorship component is something that you can essentially do for free. Um, and that in co-op, we're always looking for alumni who are willing to you know, help us out with tech interview prep or just kind of general career advice. And we've had some alums reach out to us who are interested in that. So just wanted to put that plug out there. Yeah, and it's definitely um, like fulfilling to see, um, to be able to be in that position and help. Uh, like it's for the alum, it's beneficial uh, in that way. And I think for the student, the alum base is only growing, um, growing larger and more uh, connected. So it's definitely beneficial to the student as well. So yeah, I, I forgot to mention that, but uh, volunteering time um, is, uh, could be almost more valuable than making uh, a donation or something like that uh, to the university because of it, it may have a multiplier effect where it could help, um, you know, 15 students help another 15 students each or something like that. Right. 
Yeah, and I do find that especially students, you know, or alums that have gone through the experience and can probably think back to what that first co-op experience was like are just, you know, so much more open to just giving back because they remember, you know, they were in those shoes however many years ago and sometimes just that that one networking opportunity could make all the difference. So yeah, that's really, really great. I actually remember um, I met HubSpot through an alum that worked at HubSpot after graduation at the, um, I think at the co-op expo awesome. that I had known when I was a student. And then he went to work at HubSpot after he graduated. Um, mm -hmm. I was intro to HubSpot via that. And great. then I stayed in contact with them via Twitter, I think during my first co-op. Um, so yeah, the networking component is also very useful on both sides. Yeah, we actually just had our, our very first virtual co-op expo not too long ago. So that went well. Um, similarly, you know, advice for alum, but what advice would you give if there are any current students watching right now who are looking for their, their maybe first or second co-op? Intentionally, when I was looking for my first co-op, I wanted to move somewhere. Um, I think at the time that was because it wasn't, um, study abroad was not a common thing in 2009 through 2014 for computer science students at least. Now it's very prevalent. Uh, mm -hmm. It actually was like, I think, discouraged given there wasn't like the proper credit mapping. So it's a good chance. I think finding a co-op that's not in Boston um, and being able to move to that, not during, I guess, during COVID, but um, generally finding that was a, a thing that I forced myself or threw myself into doing um, for my first co-op and that was rewarding for sure. So I moved to San Diego for my first co-op. Um, yeah. And then I would also say that don't be afraid to look into different roles than the ones that you were thinking you wanted to look at, because now would be the time uh, to do that exploration. Fantastic. Um, is there anything else that, you know, we haven't covered before we open it up to some of the questions that may have come through that you would want to, you know, share about your experience at Northeastern or beyond? Um, yeah, I think, so yeah, like I said, maybe this was kind of covered in the last question, but one thing would be definitely um, now is the time to make those, uh, take those risks and not worry about, um, or not necessarily worry as much about if you're um, even directionally correct, let alone correct. Um, so consider being, consider making, taking some of those risks and chances about job role, location, um, and all of that. And then also uh, try to maintain a good balance as well academically. So um, if you continue working for one of your co-op employers after you graduate or after you leave co-op, which I think is uh, is or was common, um, make sure that you you also like transition back into the academic and class classroom classwork um, setting as well and give that your focus during that period of time too, because that's still, even though you have this experience that was uh, industrial, it's still important to, uh, you know, maintain the academic rigor as well, to be able to graduate and get um, to, you know, maintain that level of, of skills and get, get a job that would be similar to what you did for co-op. One thing that, um, one thing that I'm, I'm working with students now, and a lot of students are expressing just how challenging it can be with time management, you know, because you're, you're trying to, like you said, keep up with classes, which we know in, in Corey, you know, are, are quite rigorous. And also, you know, searching for a job essentially full time. And that, that's, that takes a lot of effort and potentially preparing for interviews for the first time. Do you remember back like how you were able to manage that process? Yeah, that was for sure. Um, I think I'm grateful that I went through that for, uh, you know, in that setting of being a student at Northeastern, but um, that's definitely a thing that I think Northeastern students graduate with and have a leg up on um, compared to uh, peers that went to other universities. Um, but yeah, it is, it is challenging uh, maintaining the academic rigor and also looking for a uh, looking for the co-op job and also deciding which one you want to do and deciding uh, like juggling all of the different um, interviews and uh, the deadlines that the companies give you for offers can definitely be a challenge. Um, so I think Northeastern definitely prepared us for that well. Uh, and I know that Corey College specifically has a co-op program that had a, a much better ratio of student to, um, or a much smaller ratio of student to um, faculty or student to co-op advisor. So take advantage of that and make sure that you leverage anything um, that the university offers you in that way. Uh, if you have any, 
if you feel like there's any um, pressure to, to do too many things at once or if you have any questions about the process. Great. So it sounds like we might have some questions, Matt. Yeah. Great. So, uh, Chris, I think the first question uh, that we have for you um, was what is your ambitions for the Jelly Fund and the various types of projects it can support? Yeah, I think we're going to, um, so there's a selection committee and the selection committee decides who um, gets the, who is granted the funds and the selection committee is appointed by the Dean. Um, and I'm on the committee, but I'm not the sole member of the committee. Um, obviously like there's, uh, there's other donors and there's other people involved in the process there too. Um, so really I don't, my specific ambitions about it are less relevant, but um, I think just being uh, consistent with the original mission statement, which was, to be, uh, to fund projects that otherwise would not have a natural or like a, a normal um, funding source within the university. I think uh, as long as that is maintained, then those are, that's what I think would be um, consistent with my original idea. I think there's definitely some opportunities like mentorship and industry, uh, industry connection and sponsorship of things like hackathons um, that could be useful as well. And that's more of like a marketing or lead gen for the fund perspective or uh, approach, but um, that's not specifically about the grants that we'd um, give out from the fund. Great. And the next question might be for actually both of you uh, that we have. So uh, one of the, the questions is uh, that um, the, the individual asks is, you showed that there's co-op uh, for business, science, political science majors, um, and, and all those different activities, but are there a lot of co-ops um, available for students in the arts, the social sciences, uh, such as psychology or art history or music? And how do they kind of play in with the different programs? I can certainly start. Um, we definitely, I mean, since I started at Quarry, which was then CCIS for all of my alums watching, um, we have always had these combined majors and I would say a lot of students, I'm not sure of the percentage, but a lot are with CAMD um, in design, game design, um, music. So there are definitely, I mean, I think one thing for sure is that CS and, and data science, it's everywhere. And so whatever company you're in, you know, someone's designing, someone's doing a website, you know, someone's looking to work on something software related. And so it really does, you can find it in any, any industry that you're looking at. Um, I do find for certain types of combined majors that students like to kind of dabble in, in both. And what I mean by that is maybe they do a software engineering co-op first, um, and then their second co-op is something, let's say more in you know, the music side. So it's, it's very, um, it's really about the student. And so as co-op advisors, we really work with our students to determine what their goals are and how we can help them best achieve. And one thing that resonated me, resonated with me when I was, um, when I first came to Northeastern was the, like the breadth of all of the uh, combined majors, especially with computer science. So, um, and also I think the flexibility of being able to go on a co-op that isn't within your own major, but had some tie into it. Uh, one example with arts specifically, like within CAMD would be the um, game design and computer science combined major um, or the design, any of the design programs and computer science. Uh, and I've seen students that are talented in both and they decide to do one or the other or find a co-op that lets them leverage both of their skill sets. Um, yeah, so, and I think the meaningful minors and the concept of integration with um, other colleges in the university also is a good way to bring in students into Corey College and introduce them to CS as well. Great. Um, so one other question that we kind of touched upon, but I think it'd be great to elaborate a little bit more on is, uh, what do you think is, in your opinion, is the best way to convince your employer or supervisor on why they should hire or pay for a you know, what is the best way to present the value add for a co-op for a company? Yeah, at Admit, um, where we hired two co-ops and three Northeastern interns over the course of two years, um, they were all on the engineering side, uh, or all on the computer science side um, and software engineering roles. It was kind of a no-brainer. We were a startup. We had, uh, I was the first employee, uh, first non-founder employee. We had two other um, employees to begin, uh, that started the company that were both founders. Um, and one of them was Northeastern affiliated. And it was, it was basically the first thing we looked for when we were hiring was let's get co-ops um, 
because we know that they can be talented or they are talented and can be extremely productive and effectively replace, um, you know, be a drop in replacement for full time. And also it's a great, again, like it's a great recruiting tool. Um, so I think just presenting the fact that like to a man, to a manager that um, a hiring manager, that the co-op program is very high value uh, and some examples of what co-ops have done um, really sells it in most cases from what I've seen. Great. And then kind of a great follow up question um, that from there is, you know, when someone's looking to get co-ops and, and they're looking to actually bring on co-ops, what are some of the uh, like important or surprising lessons you learned from your first cohorts of having co-ops? And then along with that, what are some common pitfalls for companies when they start a co-op program? One lesson that um, we discovered really early on was uh, when you post that application or when you post the job description, um, you get slammed with resumes. There's like, you know, uh, in our case, we had like 50 people that had submitted a resume and just going through them is, um, it's a very talented set, like a very qualified set of people, especially for that kind of a role. Um, so going through them can be uh, time consuming and overwhelming a bit. Um, so really refining the job description uh, and maybe even being more specific because you have that luxury of being specific and being um, being more picky with uh, the kind of people, the kind of students that uh, and skill sets that you want to bring in um, was a thing that I think we've learned to refine over time. Um, so for example, as a co-op employer, you can say, you only want to hire second or third co-op students. Um, or you can say, I only want to hire first co-op, first time co-op students because um, they're, they bring in a fresh perspective and they have, um, they, they might be more uh, familiar with technology given their class year than, like certain technologies given their class year than people that were two or three years um, into the co-op program. Uh, so refining and deciding and being really picky, I think um, is kind of both the challenge, but also the opportunity for, um, for co-op hiring. Great. And I'd also like to just chime in and say, you know, if anyone's thinking about starting a co-op program, um, certainly you can reach out to me. Um, all of our colleagues on the co-op team are really here to partner with our employers and to, you know, help them strategize how to make their co-op program most effective. And we're happy to, you know, look at job descriptions and really kind of talk through the best practices that we've picked up over the years. So we're always happy to have those conversations. Definitely, like, so when we, our second round of hiring, we definitely leverage that. Um, and it was always there for sure. I think we just didn't know that we needed to. Um, so the co-op department is both useful and helpful to the, the students, um, obviously applying for co-ops, but also to the employers. Uh, Cause building that relationship um, on the employer side is what keeps the co-op program going obviously. And then building the student, um, skill sets to fill the seats is also obviously um, the, the primary goal. Great. And so one of the next questions that we have is while you were on your co-op and, and I think you also said like you were looking also to travel a little bit too for your, your first co-op. Did you feel like you were missing the college experience back on campus or how did you, how, how did you kind of still enjoy being a college student while being on co-op? Yeah. So I definitely was, when I left Boston for the first time, I was kind of, I felt like it was my, you know, going to be the last time I had summer break, right? Like, which was a concept that I had known about or that I had had for all of my, you know, elementary, middle and high school uh, years. And then also freshman and sophomore year at Northeastern. So it was weird. It felt like I was, it was like the end of summer break. Um, but very quickly, I realized like I didn't, that didn't matter. Um, it, the transition from that, to um, just living and working and being even like when I came back and did summer two or summer one classes, um, being a student at the same time um, was not difficult. So I think it seems daunting and seems like a big change, but uh, again, you're kind of thrown into it and it's not the kind of thing that you, um, that like, I think I, or at least I, and a lot of people I know adjusted very quickly to it um, and didn't really miss out on any experiences. I think it was only additive. I also think that, you know, if you're if you're on campus um, in Boston, certainly participating, you know, living in the dorms and um, also being a part of clubs and everything is still very active. Um, I think one thing that has has been, you know, helpful around this whole pandemic situation that we're in, which, you know, always trying to look for 
silver linings is that, you know, everyone's doing a lot of club work virtually as well. So to be inclusive of all the students that are not in the Boston area. So I imagine that will continue as students are able to go back um, and, and co-op in all different areas of the country and also the world. Yeah. And like Northeastern by nature has to structure things to support um, students that are transient, I guess, like that would be um, part-time on campus and then uh, for the second half of the year move somewhere else um, and then come back. And I think that's so baked into the operations of the university that it doesn't feel like um, it feels pretty seamless as a student especially now I think they're handling COVID um, pretty well. And I think the, the fact that uh, the co-op program creates that, um, I think it kind of the co-op program and like the fact that students are on campus and off campus and always moving, I think kind of set Northeastern up for success in that way too. Great. And we actually, it looks like we may actually have a, a prospective student that's looking at Northeastern too, that has a question. But, it, and I think it's kind of interesting and good for alumni to also kind of know too, does the university help designate co-ops to each student or when you were looking kind of for your, um, for your co-op, how much was you actively looking and how much was it, you know, working with Melissa to kind of help build that relationship to get that co-op? Great question. Um, it was definitely some combination for the very first co-op. Um, when I chose Intuit, Intuit was, I think, one of the big employers at the time, and it was, they, they were pretty prevalent front and center at a lot of the events. Um, and uh, that seemed like it was a safe choice um, in the way that like it was a company that was established, the university had a good relationship with, uh, and they had a big cohort of students going to, to work at Intuit for that cycle. Um, and then for my third co-op, the exact opposite, I found my own co-op that wasn't in the catalog or wasn't in the, um, in the database of jobs. Uh, and then created that myself by going to Melissa and um, she basically uh, entered it into the system and said, this is what he's doing for six months. Um, and it was, it felt like a fully self-service, self-sufficient um, kind of job, job search at that point. Cause I had had the experience from the first two um, that was starting with being a bit more handholding and then um, kind of moving into being fully independent on it. Um, and that definitely like being able to do that, and get that skill while I was a student um, set me up for, uh, and I think a lot of my peers as well for being, um, for the job search for full-time jobs after graduation, um, made it so much better, I think, than the experiences I had seen from other students at other universities uh, that didn't have that, that industrial experience. And that's honestly, I mean, that's honestly the goal is to really, you know, create a, just a success kind of pathway for students. So they don't, they need us less and less. As, as they move on um, throughout their co-op searches. And to kind of dig into that question a little bit more is that you know, we, we work with our students and we're here for all of the support that they need. So I often tell my students, you know, if you have questions, if you wanna just send me a thank you email that you're planning to send to a company just for a first set of eyes on it, if it's your first thank you email you've ever read, written, um, I'm happy to read that over. If you have questions about um, interview feedback that you want to digest or, you know, you're making decisions between offers. I mean, we're really here for every step of that process as well as on the actual co-op. So if there's situations happening on co-op and you would, students would like just a kind of a friendly face to chat with and kind of talk it through for some advice, we're also here for that. Um, but we're not, you know, we're not a placement agency, and I'm not sure if that's what the student was getting at. I mean, it's very independent for the student. They're applying to positions. You know, we're setting up the, the platform, essentially. We're, we're creating those relationships, um, and we're, but we're coaching our students how to also go outside of NU Works, like Chris did. Um, and so we are working with the students to kind of give them the skills, but the actual job search is very much mirrors a real life job search. You know, they're applying and it's completely up to the employer about who they call in for interviews and it kind of goes on from there. Great. Um, so the next question that we have from the audience is, um, if you were a student, uh, if, if a student were to transfer into Quarry from the Explore program, uh, would their co-op opportunities be a little bit diminished? Which is kind of what, what they're looking at. So I don't, I don't, 
Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I would, would say no. Um, obviously, I'd need to kind of talk to the student and learn a little bit more, but assuming they still have the opportunity to complete co-op, depending on when their graduation date is, um, I, I I'm not sure if the student can expand a little bit, but yeah, we would work with you and just in the same way that we would work with our, you know, original Corey students when they came in. We would take our, our preparation course, you know, every student needs to take a co-op prep course and then you would be assigned a coordinator um, and the process would move from there. Like during my freshman year, um, for the co-op course that uh, Melissa's mentioning now, um, we had students that were, uh, I think, not freshmen, not only freshmen, and we also had transfer students that came from other universities. Um, so we were all put into the same, um, the same pipe that I think uh, gave us all the same experiences and the same, uh, regardless of how we started, basically. So I think that hopefully that would be, um, that is reassuring to the student about uh, asking about the Explore program. Great. And then, you know, I think we have, we have several students on uh, the call today. And I think a lot of them are kind of coming up with the same kind of question that I've been kind of seeing here is, what advice would you give to a student who aren't sure what co-op they want to do next? You know, and what should they do? Should, uh, what questions that do you think are good questions for them to ask? Um, what activities, you know, whether it's going to coffee or meeting up with different people and having, you know, virtual Zoom <laughs> coffee meetups? Um, you know, what helped you and, you know, that, and some of your friends too that at Northeastern and you're there get to figure out what they wanted to do next? Um, so while I, decided I wanted to move, I still feel like I, um, I kind of picked for the first two co-ops uh, the easy or common employers because I felt like they were, like I said, they were big companies uh, or big enough companies that they were established. Um, so, but then I think in contrast, my third co-op, um, I found out about that company and that kind of a role through friends that either worked there um, or friends that had done similar work. Um, similar work in terms of the product management role instead of the software engineering role. So from that, I think just from networking and talking to friends about um, their experiences in that kind of a role, that's what helped me decide uh, that I wanted to give that a try. It wasn't really, uh, it wasn't driven by the, the co-op program necessarily. It wasn't driven from academics. It was totally um, just networking and talking to people and feeling things out. So I would say my answer for that question would be don't um, don't try to be too rigorous about it. I think just go with what your gut is telling you, um, and uh, like still explore a lot of options. But don't don't try to over optimize because I think over optimizing um, kind of makes you have like this analysis paralysis that uh, you might make the wrong decision if you know more than you would have if you had just picked something that you thought was interesting. Again, given that this is not um, this is the time to take risks on those kinds of things. And one thing I would add to that is, you know, Chris, you were talking about your network. And I think when students first, you know, come into Northeastern and they start their first co-op search, they don't feel as though they have much of a network. And that changes very quickly when you and all of your peers are going out on co-op. Suddenly our network is huge because you know all these people that have worked in all these different companies around and, and then they know people. And so then it really just opens up so much. And so, and LinkedIn, and, and we do a lot of work now in the class. Um, Chris, the class has changed a lot since you went through um, about networking and kind of utilizing LinkedIn because we're all on LinkedIn, right? And so it's very easy to find other people at Northeastern that are doing things that you might be interested in. And if you're connected through some sort of group on LinkedIn, it's very easy to just ask. You know, you could ask some questions, and every single person that I've reached out to to try and if a student said, oh, you're connected to this, this alum, could you put me in touch? They've always said yes. And so it's really kind of creating those relationships and just having conversations and doing kind of your own work to, to learn as much as you can about the different people that are out there and willing to share their experiences. Yeah, I will say everyone was very helpful at every step of the process. Um, and in the same way, I think alums now would be willing to be helpful to students uh, even if a random student emailed and asked for um, some advice on something, uh, which I think has has definitely happened to me and other friends that are alums from Corey, um, being helpful in that way, uh, you know, is definitely uh, like we're definitely willing to help in that way. 
Great, uh, thank you so much. I think the next question is, I think we have a lot of questions coming from our, some of our students too about co-op in general. Um, and, and Chris and Melissa, you might be able to kind of both answer some of these. Um, I kind of put them all together because um, it's probably like a little bit of a package deal. Um, I think the one, one of the questions are research co-ops paid? Uh, and then along with that, can a Northeastern student get a co-op that takes place at another university or abroad? Um, and then I think the other questions are kind of all tied into like tuition. How does co-ops affect your tuition? Are you still living on campus? Are, do you still have a meal plan? And, and all the different questions that kind of come along with that too. Sure. So I can definitely start um, with the research co-ops and we have a lot of research co-ops, you know, through Northeastern that um, tend to be paid. Um, I don't want to say 100%, but I know basically all of the ones posted through Corey are paid. Um, and those are six month co-ops. And a lot of our students choose to do that, um, whether they are looking to go on to do their PhD or if they're just very interested in the work that one of our professors are, are doing. Um, I'm actually currently working with a student who through his own network um, is working is going to be working in January at a research um, university in Singapore. So I just had a conversation with um, the faculty member there to kind of talk it out. And so, yes, um, we definitely have students who find research opportunities at other universities and that can count as a co-op. It's not something that we would have necessarily in NU Works, although I'm definitely working on having this position be a repeat in the future. Um, but we just talk, talk out um, the different, you know, co-op expectations and have those conversations. And once we approve it, it's, it's in our system and it will count as a co-op. Um, for the tuition question, I can, I can jump on that too. Um, so you are not paying tuition while you're on co-op unless you're taking a class, of course. Um, most of our students choose not to do that because um, you're on co-op full time for, for six months. So. Um, you wouldn't be paying tuition unless you were actually taking a class. And I forget if I missed any other questions, Matt. Um, I, th I, think, I think it was just, do, mo do most people co-ops um, still live on campus and keep the meal plan or are they off campus during their co-op? Chris, do you want to take a stab at that one? Sure. Um, I don't think I had a meal plan after freshman year. so. Um, I would assume that if you don't live on campus, you wouldn't, or I know that if you don't live on campus, you wouldn't have a meal plan. If you do live on campus, uh, by the time you're doing co-op, you're probably in housing that has um, a kitchen. And I think most students in that case don't have a meal plan or don't opt to get a meal plan. You still can if you want to, but it's um, it's not required in, in that setting. And so I think kind of maybe the general sense of the question is if you're on co-op in Boston, you can essentially assume, you know, your your life living in dorms or your apartment, meal plan, no meal plan, gym, Reno, like you, you'd be doing the same exact thing that you'd be doing, except you're not taking classes, you know, you're waking up and you're, you're going to work, um, obviously in post COVID times. Um, otherwise, you're just waking up and logging into your computer. Um, but if you're not working, uh, if you're not in Boston, and let's say you are somewhere else, you know, like Chris did, then you are, you know, essentially finding housing, or it's possibly it's possible that the company would provide housing, um, or at least some sort of service that would help you find housing in that area. Northeastern also has um, an off-campus student housing department that also helps with that. We have various housing pockets kind of all around in our main kind of co-op hubs. So we could definitely talk more about that um, for whoever is asking that question. Now, and here, here's a good question, uh, kind of both for both of you. So, you know, you have a lot of these large companies that are, you know, like HubSpot or um, Google or Facebook that are, are well known. How, how do you pitch to a CS student that might be getting, a, you know, the lesser name, play, you know, a lesser name company and what the value of that company would be to be also joining them um, for their co-op opportunity? I think a lot of students really actually, um, at least from my experience and from talking to friends that did co-op at the same time as I did, um, opted to work at smaller companies and didn't, uh, like, I think there was the companies like Amazon and Twitter and Google that people wanted to work at, but um, 
they had limited seats and they had, uh, you know, they had um, a lengthy interview process and uh, startups were like definitely appealing to students, at least at the time. Um, and I think a lot of people end up going to a company that gives them the experience of a startup because they get, um, they get to wear a few hats at once and they get to, um, it's a small team and they get to learn a lot um, faster. I think at the same time, uh, companies like Amazon that hire for certain kinds of roles, like if you um, have a specific interest in robotics, for example, you can go work at Amazon robotics. Um, and that's, you know, that would be a company that you're choosing purposefully strategically to pursue that interest. Um, and I worked at Intuit, which was a big company for my first co-op, uh, you know, publicly traded, they have multiple offices, all that. Um, and getting the experience of having that kind of a company and then working at HubSpot at the time that had like 300 employees, I believe. Um, that was a cool transition and being able to see both sides was, was valuable. So I don't think that people always are competing for like the seats at Google um, and Facebook, but uh, it definitely is for some people and definitely um, other people opt to not do that. Yeah, and I actually was just having a conversation today with a student who I happened to notice was applying to a lot of, you know, really big name companies. Um, and so we had that, we had a, a very similar conversation, which was about at the end of the day, you want a job that is going to give you a lot of opportunity. Um, so sure, like a, a name like Google is certainly eye catching on a resume. But if your job, it's really about your job and the skills that you're going to gain from that and how you can use that as a stepping stone to your next, your next job opportunity. And so oftentimes, I mean, Chris mentioned working at HubSpot um, when it was 300, you know, people and obviously it's grown so much since then. And so it's become a, even a bigger name. So you also could be kind of at the, the starting point of a company that is kind of making its way. And I think that's also really exciting. I think diversifying across both kinds of experiences um, is probably the name of the game in this case. Mm -hmm. um, that's like one thing you can do strategically, but primarily I would say optimizing for learning uh, again while you're in this environment is the most important thing. And that's something too that, you know, we haven't really talked about yet, but you know, certainly co-op is about the job experience, but it's also kind of determining what type of office environment, you know, you're, you're interested in working for a large company and what are the pros and cons of that working for a startup. What are the pros and cons for that? Sometimes students think they want something, but then they actually experience it and they realize that, you know what, I think I want to try something different and who knows what direction they would have gone in if they hadn't had that experience and they just, you know, went through school, graduated and started their job and then realizing, oh, this is actually not what I wanted to do. So, I think it's very helpful to be able to kind of test the waters. And I would also add that like, there's probably 10 different paths that you could take that you'd be equally happy doing. Um, so do not worrying about like there being only one path, um, I think is uh, both like helps you relax with the process and also um, is realistic. Like I think there are 10 different companies I could have worked at for my first co-op in theory that I probably would have had the same experience or the same level of satisfaction and learning with. Um, so don't worry about if you don't get your top choice or your second top choice, uh, anything like that. Great. Um, so one, one other question that we had from uh, one of another of our high school seniors that are actually on uh, for this call is, um, he wants to know if, uh, if you think that real jobs offered by co-op employers can be considered insecure jobs since co-op employers are constantly looking for people to better fit their company's needs. Um, Melissa, do you want to start? I don't think, I'm not sure. Hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I, I don't yeah, think they're, I'm, I don't think they're insecure though. I think they're, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to understand a little bit more about um, what this particular question is pointing to. Um, I mean, I think co-op employers, yes, they're always going to look for people to fit their needs. But I think that when companies are hiring for co-op, they're not there. Of course, they're looking for the pipeline. That's definitely when you think about what the employer's goals are, they are looking to find people that will hopefully work for them um, long term. But I think another real, really big goal of, of employers that sign on for co-op are to actually mentor and help educate students and potentially future leaders in the tech industry. 
So there's that component, like that's a win for, for employers as well. And I know lots of employers who are still in touch with their former co-op students who never went back to work for them, but they're colleagues now, you know, and they, and they stay in touch. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what Arthur is getting at, but Chris, if you have anything to add. Yeah, I think I understand the question now. Um, I would agree. So I think what you're saying is that it does not feel transactional. And I would agree. It doesn't feel transactional to me. It's felt like on both sides being able or being a co-op um, employee and then being a co-op employer, um, building a relationship with either the company that I'm working for or the student that I've hired. Uh, so much so that uh, I would recommend those students um, after graduation to work at companies that I am not working at. Uh, like I would give them my uh, like a positive recommendation. Um, and I would also expect that uh, a lot of co-op students um, or a lot of my former co-op employers would probably be willing to connect me elsewhere um, as well if I wanted that. So it's not just about them filling a seat, um, but it is also an easy sell because it is an easy way to fill a seat. And it's also a very high value way um, that doesn't feel like it's a, uh, that do, or I guess it does feel like it's a drop-in replacement for a full-time person, um, like the same level of quality, basically, uh, depending on the experience of the student. Um, so yeah, it, it does not feel transactional or insecure to me in that way. Great, and I think we have a really great question for you, Chris, uh, as, as kind of a good way to kind of look at it. What's next? What's next for you? <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm still, still doing um, client work, so full-time um, client work and building a couple of small um, products on the side. So kind of gonna be, uh, there'll be some, some updates on that in the future, but um, working on starting a couple of small things as well. Um, and then also, I think I need to definitely uh, work on work-life balance and take some time off too. So I might do that in the next few months, but, and then get back to work uh, full-time again. Great. I, I think one other question that, I, um, that I've seen kind of come up as well too is, how have you seen co-ops change at all during the land of COVID that we're in? And having virtual uh, co-op experiences that some of our students are having and, and kind of maybe even virtual experiences that you've had as kind of a mentee uh, for some co-ops. Sure, I don't have, um, I don't currently have co-ops and I have not had co-ops since um, uh, last year. So at Admit, I had co-ops full-time for two years, but um, I've had part-time students that have worked uh, on some client projects with me, but um, I have not had a co-op employee during COVID. I would imagine though that it is, it doesn't feel any different than it would be. Um, like, I think it's probably a similar experience to uh, how people feel going to work now, like from home. Um, I don't think that it, it, there's anything about the co-op program specifically that would make it uh, more nuanced than that. And I can add that, you know, obviously this spring we had students on co-op um, who started off on ground and then COVID hit and went online. So we, we have what their experience was like and they were, you know, had already been onboarded, they were working, you know, they knew their coworkers. Um, so I think for them, it wasn't a huge impact just because the majority of our companies were very well positioned to transition to remote work. Many were already doing that to begin with. Um, the students that are on co-op now, uh, it started in July. I am curious to hear what their experience is like because these are our first like true virtual from start, most likely to finish co-op students. Um, and from the, the ch I've chatted with a couple of them just through email and you know, things seem to be going really well. They are doing, the work is, is the same. You know, it's really about the communication um, and how you're, how you're interacting with your coworkers, which I can certainly relate to as well. You know, we're, we were very used to our hallway chatter um, and now we're chatting on Microsoft Teams a lot. So, you know, it's just a different way of kind of approaching communication, in my opinion. And a lot of software jobs have been, um, you know, flex remote or on site for a while now, too. Like, I think that's definitely a trend independent of COVID. Um, so when I was at Admit, uh, I would work from home, you know, maybe once a week and would also encourage the co-ops to do the same. Um, I think there's uh, the software engineering job role is probably a little bit closer to what COVID, or it's a little bit less, it feels a little bit less alien uh, in COVID than a job that I think 
requires uh, you know more in-person interaction versus things like that are just computer work or Slack um, or like whiteboard meetings, things like that. So uh, I don't think it's going to be materially different. Great. And I think, uh, you know, I think we've gotten to most of the questions. I apologize if we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, but we'll make sure to save that chat and, uh, and try to get them over, get an answer over to you. But, you know, just looking at time and trying to be conscious of that, I wanted to kind of pitch it over to both of you for kind of a final thought of, you know, what's the importance of, you know, the Jelly Fund, co-op, and, and everything that is with Northeastern. Uh, any final thoughts that you may have? I'm happy uh, to start. Yeah, feel free to start. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so Chris, it's, it's definitely been a pleasure chatting with you and seeing you. And, you know, definitely one of the favorite parts of my job is really experiencing the growth of a student while at Northeastern and then being able to work with them kind of in their post-grad life as an employer. And I truly believe that former co-op students make pretty amazing co-op managers. Um, and, and that for me is like the full cycle, you know, I, I work with students when they're students and then I get to collaborate with them as they're managing my current co-op students. So it's a pretty nice, it's a pretty nice cycle and I see some familiar faces, well not faces, names um, in the chat of some former students and it's great to, um, to see their names pop up again. Yeah, I would say it's equally fulfilling um, on both sides and it's the kind of thing that uh, as a student when you're looking for co-op, looking for a co-op, you don't really consider, um, like I didn't think that I would really be in a position uh, five, six years out of graduation to be hiring co-ops, but um, I think it's definitely, uh, it's definitely cool to see, like you said, it come full cycle um, or full circle, I think, yeah. Um, and that's, that's definitely the, uh, the fulfilling component to me. Uh, and then also like the benefits, um, like beyond just the like the benefit of the co-op program to students I think it's uh, like we said beneficial to employers um, and puts Northeastern on the map in a cool way. Well great well thank you both of you so much for this evening it was really great hearing your experiences and, and you know hearing more about the Jelly Fund and all, all the great co-op experiences that come from Northeastern. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of our participants. Uh, it was really great kind of, hopefully I, like I said, got to most of your questions uh, and we'll try to get to any ones that we weren't able to get to. Um, one last pitch is uh, you will be receiving a survey from us just to check in on how the event went. So I always encourage everyone, if you can please make sure to fill that out. I know filling out those surveys can be a little difficult, but I promise you it is literally only about a minute long. Um, so it'd be really helpful for us. Uh, but if you have any other questions too, feel free to always shoot us our, our way. Uh, we're always happy to kind of talk to you. Um, but with that, I will say thank you very much and have a great night, everyone. Thank you.